35, 36 birthday candles ago when when the birthday cake didn't look like your funeral pyre and I still had enough puff in my lungs to blow the bloody candles out, I discovered, as millions did that particular year, a new, a new writer. And I fell instantly and utterly in love with this bloke, as I would a little later with uh, Joseph Heller for a, a comparable book, Catch-22. Close friend of mine, may I say. Is he? Oh, it was. He's dead. Oh, look, I can't, hand, I, can't, I can't handle all this bad news. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, well, I, keep, I have the same experience. I keep asking about this person or that person. And they've been dead for years. The voice off, dear listener, is that of the aforementioned hero, Kurt Vonnegut. Now, our old mate, uh, our old mate Harold Bloom wrote his book Cat's Cradle as a part of the Western canon of literature, but the book I was talking about was Slaughterhouse-Five, and it's dominated in my mind and memory by a wonderful image. Well, I, I was uh, very lucky as I did. It, it worked. It's uh, it it just that sort of flying backwards from <laughs> over the burning over the the, the burning Dresden with yes. the with the bombs sucking the flames in and then being carried up into the bellies of the aircraft flown back to Britain where they were deconstructed and the component parts buried in mines. Do you know that uh, an Australian set that passage to music? No, I didn't. Yes, and, and I understand it was for sale in Australia. Uh, yeah, he's, he's working in California now, in Hollywood, and I guess he's writing for movies, a composer. But his name is Simon Heselev, H-E-S-E-L-E-V. And uh, he was a music student, and uh, uh, one of his professors brought me this recording. And damn, he had taken that, <laughs> taken that backward uh, movie about an air raid uh, and set it to music. And it's a knockout, but I, I think it was for sale in... Uh, Mate, we'll track it down. The ABC... Well, right, well the, name of the, <laughs> the name of it, it's a very pretty, pretty jacket and everything, is, is Talk Tick. Talk Tick. And I presume it's played backwards as well, to be consistent. <laughs> the voice of Kurt Vonnegut, remarkably uh, lively, because he's 82, he lives on cigarettes, unfiltered, unfiltered uh, Pall Mall. Pall Mall. Is, is that right? Yes. And they've, they've kept you going all these years. And they've made me intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> John Houston once attributed his great age to surgery. So you, you you give yours to cigarettes. It's excellent. You're a great role model. <laughs> I I imagine at the moment you'd like to see that image of your backward flying bombers becoming U.S. foreign policy, where of course the opposite has happened. Yes. Well, you know, I always hope somebody is going to rescue us from our stupidity. And you know, I I thought that. Uh, you know, England would would be uh, uh, the Greeks to our Romans, and hell is as uh, they were uh, their prime minister is as asinine as our president. I mean, it's really stupid. And I have what I have tried to ignore because I'm fond of Australia, but you didn't stop it either. No, we signed up. We were the first cab off the rank, Kurt. We've always gone to American wars. We're great enthusiasts for them. Well, as you fought very well, uh, I, I must say, and and have the reputation of, of being ferocious fighters. Is it, do you think there's anything to that? Well, I'd, they, I'd I'd prefer us to be ferocious peacemakers at the moment. But <laughs> are you, do you feel isolated in the United States with your, um, you know, absolutely firm personal views of? Uh, on politics, do you feel like you're the last angry man sometimes? No, because because uh, well, whenever I tell anybody, unfortunately, I have taught creative writing occasionally, and uh, what I do and what I've recommended people do is to write a story that says you are not alone; others feel as you do, and there are a lot of people who feel as I do. And uh, they simply are not represented. And many of them, I think, are listening to this program. Kurt, the other night we did a program on Abraham Lincoln. 
yes. and on his uh, battle with the black dog, you know, with depression. Yes. And, the, and the scholar who was uh, putting this thesis up said that his deep melancholy gave him a depth of perception that perhaps a, a happier person wouldn't have had, that it prepared him for his task. You know, And I find that fairly persuasive, being a melancholic. Well, it, it's certainly a very romantic idea. But you're uh, a melancholic, but, aren't you, in, in a profound sense? Yes, but I, I uh, haven't had a terminal case of it. And I, I guess uh, the real thing is... is uh, Really, quite horrible. But I, 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 Lincoln again had a mild case, and uh, there is this romance. Is is critics would like to feel, uh, of course, that artists are sick in some way, <laughs> or capable people are sick in some way. Uh, but uh, I, I'm, whatever made Lincoln what he was is, uh, uh, I'm certainly grateful for. And during my own lifetime. Uh, I had a great president who seemed a great president to me was Franklin Roosevelt, and I was talking to a political scientist uh, over here and uh, about uh, Roosevelt and you know how compassionate he was, and he said that people in his field were convinced that what made him so compassionate was that he had infantile paralysis, mm, mm. and so he was able to know what it was. Uh, to be incapacitated. What gave you your depth of perception? You, 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 you summed up the subject of all great books as what a bummer it is to be a human yeah. being. So, you <laughs> disagree? No, I don't. Of course I don't. But I'm, I'm sort of happy with, with being a bummer sometimes, I must admit. But how did you get to this clarity of vision? I... Uh... Well, I don't know, because I don't credit myself with that. And and so from my point of view, I have nothing to explain or, or, or wonder about. As I, uh, I was just lucky. Uh, that's all I can say. And I, you know, I have a survivor syndrome, uh, partly because of the Dresden Firestorm, of course. There was so much death around, and somehow I got out of it. And uh, there have been other events like that where I've survived. But actually, I have known perfectly wonderful writers who got practically no recognition. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what I have said uh, is I'm, uh, I'm the asshole who broke the bank at Monte Carlo, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I understand you sometimes have a notice saying, please notice when you're happy. Yes. Well, that was my uncle's recommendation, and, I, and people have thanked me for that. Is a uh, uh, yeah, I had a, a good uncle, which was Uncle Alex, and a bad uncle, who was Uncle Dan. And uh, Uncle Alex uh, said that one thing he, he he didn't like about people was that they so seldom noticed it when they were really happy, and so we would be drinking lemonade under the shade of an apple tree in the 4th of July, and, uh, you know, we'd be talking about this and that and just buzzing like honeybees, and he would all of a sudden interrupt and say, if this isn't nice, I don't know what is. And ever so often he would say that, and uh, I uh, I try to do that, and I've recommended it in graduation addresses, uh, that people do that, and I got one letter who uh, uh, says he customarily says it in the middle of sexual intercourse now. Well, that's a very good time to say it. Now, listener, would you write that down, right? Please write that <laughs> down and say it during sexual intercourse On and, and think of Kurt as you, as, you, as you climax. I think that's... If this isn't nice, I don't know what is. <laughs> well, let's go back to a time that was decidedly not nice. Let's go back to... To 1944, when you were, well, almost a kid in the U.S. Army, you're captured by the Germans, yes, and you're in Dresden when it was firebombed by the Allied forces. Yes, it forces. was. It was burned to the ground. A hundred, it, it a hundred thousand people died. At least, uh, but you know that, that's Guinness Book of Record stuff. Is uh, 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 none of these numbers of casualties are all that interesting. Is plenty of people died. That's uh, and they, this beautiful work of art which was undefended, incidentally. The Germans figured if they left it undefended, it wouldn't be attacked. And no, no war industries there to speak of. Uh, 
And it was a Brit who burned it down in, 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 at night time uh, with new incendiary bombs. They used to be about the size of a croquet stake, you know, and these were about the size of a shotgun shell. Anyway, they scattered these, just as uh, it was salt or pepper, over a city. And uh, the whole thing burned down. And uh, what I've said, too, is that uh, the war was almost over when they did that, you realize. That mm. was in February, March, April, May. They, uh, the Germans were in full retreat on all fronts at that time. Uh, and I've said that only one person benefited from the firebombing of, of uh, Dresden. Is Not one person got out of a death camp a second earlier. Not one German deserted his defensive position a second earlier. I am the only person who benefited, and uh, I've gotten, I don't know, probably $20 for each person killed. But nobody's ever argued. And so it goes. That 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 m miraculous four words that you use every time someone dies. Well, it's in every language. Is it? Yeah. And so it goes. Yeah, it's just acceptance. What can you do? There's a there's a very famous Australian bush ranger. Do you know that term? Yes. Ned Ned Kelly and his dying words on the gallows. He's a great national hero in this country are said to be such as life. <laughs> God, I love it. It's not it's not a lot different, is it, in, in its no, sense? No, but good for me. Is, is he's my hero, too, now. <laughs> well, he, couldn't Kurt, have he, done, he couldn't have done better. No. You must say, and so it goes a lot, because here you are in your 80s, and you would have outlived most of your friends by now. Yes, that's true. That's true. Well, you had the same experience when you found out that Joe Heller was dead. Uh, yes, it's, uh, and uh, I don't like living this long, but about uh, Gallo's speeches, uh, I love that one that you gave me, and I'd never heard it before. Uh, but a man was about to be electrocuted in Chicago. They used to have the electrocutions in the, in the jail there, and... Uh, uh, just before they pulled the switch, uh, the man in the chair, I don't remember his name, said, this will certainly teach me a lesson. <laughs> That's not bad either, is it? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> there's, a great, there's a great British and, uh, and Australian by appropriation comedian called um, Spike Milligan, and he, yes. he wanted his epitaph to be, I told you I was sick. <laughs> 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 what will yours be? So it goes? No, no. It's, uh, uh, <clears throat> the only proof he needed of the existence of God was music. It's a great line. It's a great well, line. Well, it's true. It's, it's music has been so healing for me and so encouraging. And how the hell this noise works, I don't know. Mm. But it, is, it, is it ever therapeutic? I guess with you it's jazz. No, anything. Anything. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was just uh, yeah, I listened to the radio a lot and and uh, to recorded music on on the radio and and uh, they had a program of Court Vile. Mm. And the mind that sounded good. <laughs> it all sounds very. But he's good. he's he's a melancholic like us, isn't he? Those those, yes, those well, bleak, right. terrifying songs. Yes, but uh, well, you have the feeling he's telling the truth. <laughs> In the in the new uh, autobiographical memoir, and I'm glad you're still writing despite your constant threats or promises not to do it, not to do it anymore. Uh, Dresden gets a run, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And uh, well, it's interesting. It was it was uh, <coughs> Field Marshal uh, Marshal Harris, I guess, uh, who was uh, Marshal of the RAF, and. Uh, they proposed, uh, I don't know, it must be 10 years ago now at least, putting up a statue to him on Trafalgar Square or somewhere, Piccadilly or whatever. And a lot of RAF guys protested. They felt disgraced having bombed civilians. And, uh, well, when 
my term as a prisoner wasn't didn't last very long. Actually, it was about five and a half months, long enough to get a book out of it. But anyway, when we were finally home on a ship and went into port in Virginia, and my best friend, my partner in infantry, Bernie O'Hare, uh, who became a district attorney, incidentally, and, and then a defense lawyer, uh, he... I said to him, because we were about to part, he was going to go home to Pennsylvania, I was going to go home to Indiana. I said, what did you learn? And he saw him in it, and he said, I'll never believe my government again. We felt disgraced. We did not know we had that kind of a country that would bomb, you know, civilians, men, women, and children. And we were going to find out very soon that uh, we were uh, indeed that some kind of a country. Big time. Big time. How did you feel when you watched uh, shock and awe over Baghdad? Well, it was so, it was so stupid. Is I, I've said on the radio here that, uh, you know, I want to say something good about our president, that he isn't the dumbest person at the top of our government, of our federal government. The dumbest person is our Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld. He was dumb enough to believe that he could take control of a country of 25 million Muslims with some great big bangs and then 200,000 soldiers who couldn't even say hello in Arabic. As, you know, I'd never been any but a corporal, but I knew you couldn't do that, and it was exceedingly dumb. You write that the, and this, I'll quote it, the America I love still exists on the front desk of a public library. Yes. Well, we have uh, absolutists in this country who who want to know what people are reading and, and to uh, discourage them from reading. You know, here we're teaching democracy in Iraq. <laughs> and the librarians, not famous for their physical strengths or powerful political connections, have just damn well refused to deal with these people at all, to refuse to take this book off the shelf or to refuse to tell you who who was taking this book out of that book. And so, yeah, and so you, you say, do I feel alone? No. And uh, there are lots of people uh, behaving honorably. Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut, I... Um, I educated myself in our public library system in Australia. It was one of our great achievements, really. And uh, were they important to you as a kid? Yes, indeed. And the librarians were so helpful. Mm. As they, as they, you know, I got really interested in snakes one time <laughs> and lizards and uh, went and told a, a, a librarian about it, a woman, and yes, she was deeply interested and, and wanted to help and, and uh, felt that she should know more about him too and all that. Just chat, 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 chat. And yes, and she found a book and let me know what you think of this and everything. Oh, what an agreeable world. I gave a speech to the public libraries, public librarians here last year and I thanked them all collectively because one of them, when I was 13 years old, took me from the kids' library into the grown-ups' library and gave me Steinbeck Scrapes of Wrath, and it changed my life. Okay. Yeah. What was the book that changed your life, do you think? Well, Before you uh, started writing books to change other people's. Uh, a lot of... Uh, God, that's a, you know, I, I would have to uh, be hypnotised. or I'd have to... Okay, uh, my watch is swinging in front of your eyes. Being... <laughs> Being trepid, uh, uh, God, there were so many. Uh, I was so grateful for well-told stories, mm. and one of the best-told stories ever was Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, tell me, Mr. Silver, have you ever seen a real pirate? <laughs> How can you beat that? Yes, now it's a, it's a wonderful book, wonderful book, written in the neighborhood, as you know just up the road in one of those Pacific Islands. Yeah. You've had enormous success. and uh, But at the same time, you you self-deprecate a lot. You say that uh, a part of your 
as well as being mad about growing old and being mad about being American, uh, you're not too happy with your 20-plus books. Uh, I don't know. No, it's, it's, yes, I, I, I am. It's, uh, uh, but again, I, I don't understand how I did it. <laughs> and uh, it happened. It simply came out of me, and uh, uh, so uh, there may be more going on than I know, and uh, I don't deserve credit for any of it. I don't care, but please, uh, no, I, I, I'm I'm quite pleased with how it turned out, and and uh, surprised. And uh, one of the troubles was being the youngest child in any family. Uh, is that your parents never found out find out how you turned out? And I wish my mother and father could see me now. Yeah, yeah, and that's, I'm sure that's right. Do you, when you say that the subject of all great books, certainly the subject of your own, is what a bummer it is to be a human being? You you clearly qualify that with a celebration of happiness, though rare. It's yeah. a beautiful thing. So, you know. <laughs> You, you're not you're not as as grumpy a curmudgeon as you pretend to be, are you? No, is uh, uh, luckily not. Again, I think it's a matter of luck. It's because there are some really ferociously <laughs> grumpy people around. And no, I have I haven't gone over the line. And I've uh, you know what a bummer life is, and uh, what is marvelous is how people respond to the. To the ordeal. There's another line of yours which I've always loved. Uh, uh, we are here on earth to fart around. <laughs> Don't let yeah. anyone tell you anything <laughs> different. That's that's terrific. Well, yes, but the, in the age of the computer, particularly, you know, we are dancing animals. We like to move around. We don't want to sit on a couch indoors and and uh, just do everything on a computer. And so I make errands. I love mailing pass it packages. <laughs> <laughs> Do you put anything in them, Kurt? Yeah, well, it's none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> I love the thought of empty packages going out. That of course the Patriot Act people, great concern. Packages coming out from Kurt Vonnegut. Yes. Well they may be watching me, I don't know. <laughs> You, you're not too um, enchanted with the computer revolution. You said it's allowed white-collar criminals to do what the mob would have loved to do, put yes. a pawn shop and a loan shark in every home. Yes, well, it has done that. It, well, there are... I am a really uh, an ultimate Luddite. I mean, if I hadn't been here and you had called, there would not, the phone would have just rung and rung and rung. I don't even have an answering <laughs> machine. <laughs> And I'm glad and, I'm glad I got you. <laughs> and I I love mailing letters and and uh, uh, meanwhile my wife is is you know she is on the web and and uh, knows all about it and and enjoys it and has friends all over the world I guess uh, I just I found everything redundant all the new technology is redundant and uh, Forbes a big business magazine in this country asked a number of us what our favorite technologies were and I uh, said the Encyclopedia Britannica because it's alphabetical. <laughs> well you could have done that. You could have you could have written alphabetically. I, this this seems a good time to talk about the technologies that are delivering you to your Australian audience. You're listening to LNL on ABC Radio National, Radio Australia, online and via I hate to tell you this Kurt Vonnegut, podcasting. Kurt Vonnegut's latest book is called Man Without a Country, and I was delighted to see something else you and I have in common, and so does Noam Chomsky. We like law and order, provided it's got Sam Waterson or Jerry Orbach in it. Oh, yes, and and uh, people have asked me, you know, who would you rather be than yourself? And uh, Jerry Orbach, without a question. Mm. Now, he's dead. I know, I, I know he's dead, and I'm very yes. sad about that. Me too, and uh, uh, I talked to him one time, and and just my, he's adorable. He was also a good hoofer. He was, a, yeah, he, he yes, was quite he was. significant on Broadway. 
Yes, and I never was. Mm. Now, I'm going to get you into trouble. This this next question will probably get you into, into Guantan- Guantanamo Bay, but uh, you write about how much you admire Eugene Debs, the great American socialist. Yes. Would you dare describe yourself as a socialist today? Of course. I do. is because I, you know, I'm somebody, and, and, and uh, there has to be a certain amount of, of uh, First Amendment toleration. And so yes, it's, and so sure, I say I'm a socialist, and uh, and uh, certainly uh, you, uh, uh, Karl Marx was a great man. He and uh, what he was trying to do is, you know, since the Industrial Revolution had scattered tribes and extended families, how people could still be taken care of the way uh, a, a family or a tribe would have done it. And uh, so he laid out this scheme for taking care of a large population, you know, taking care of them in childhood when they're old, uh, which a tribe would have done. And uh, so it was a good try on his part. I think the other bloke who probably uh, would have tried to do the same things was uh, Jesus Christ. But these days, of course, he seems to vote Republican. (laughs) No, uh, people claim he votes Republican. (laughs) But he's... I have yet one of one of these Bush supporters to quote Jesus Christ. <laughs> I don't think they have any idea what he stood for. Well, you use the word merciful, and that's not an attribute of the religious right, is it? No, it certainly is not. Uh, but the uh, well, it's look. It is Christianity is is just a totem. That's all. Is I'm a Christian, and uh, that bonds me to a whole lot of other people. But uh, one of the biggest secrets in the Second World War uh, was that the swastika was a Christian cross. It was for a working man's party, uh, Christian working man's party, and it's it's a cross of tools, which is a very nice idea. It's axes. Mm. Uh, but no. So a variation uh, on the hammer and the sickle. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, uh, hell, the, the Germans had uh, conventional crosses painted on their airplanes and tanks, and uh, but that Hitler was a Christian was the uh, uh, biggest secret in the war, I guess. <laughs> the religious right, of course, continues to rampage across America. But I was talking to Simon. Uh, Blumenthal last night on the program, and he was saying that the great Bush experiment is now rapidly becoming unstuck. I hope to live long enough to see that happen. It must be something that sustains you, that hope. Yes, but uh, he has done such damage. Uh, I mean, among other things, we're among the most poorly educated people in the world. Uh, And... uh, so the d- damage is quite permanent, and also, I, you know, I'm a kind of a depressing fellow. Uh, uh, we have damaged the uh, planet uh, with our drunken brin- binge on petroleum and other fossil fuels uh, that it, it cannot recover. I love that. I, lo- I loved something you wrote. Uh, you said you grew up in Indianapolis, which is the home of the of the famous motor speedway and the Indy 500 car race. And you said that when I got here in 1922, this country was already roaring drunk on petroleum, and we are still roaring drunk on petroleum. Yes, and and all anybody is saying is don't stop the party. uh, Keep the petroleum coming any way you can until I'm dead, and after that I won't give a damn. And uh, that... That, that's actually going on, you see. Kurt, how do you feel now? Let's let's uh, a couple of old codgers together. No one's listening. It's just you and I. How old are you? I'm not going to tell you because I'm not quite old enough to to compete. But I feel as old as you. No, I'm 66, uh, so I feel, right. I feel ancient. You see. Yes. Uh, how do you how do you feel about time running out? On the planet. For you. Oh, uh, well. Uh, I like sleep. I'm crazy about sleep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you'll be happy when you're dead. You get <laughs> Does your personal sort of theology, cosmology, give you an afterlife? 
No, absolutely not, and I am. What, do you have people called humanists over there? Yep, I'm one of them, yeah. All right, well, we have an American Humanist Association, and I am uh, uh, honorary president of it, and I succeeded the great science fiction writer Isaac Asimov as mm. the honorary president. And, uh, no, we don't believe in rewards or punishments in an afterlife, and uh, we serve as best we can the only abstraction with which we have any real familiarity, which is our community. Now, uh, I, I take this position publicly in Australia and am inundated with complaints from readers, not so much from listeners, saying, with, if you don't believe, you cannot have a basis, a moral basis for judgment or for your life. In other words, it's only those god brothers that have a copyright on any sort of morality what's your answer to that well it's it's uh, an awful lot about me as an original and uh nietzsche said something perfectly wonderful which uh, ought to be quoted more uh he said only a person of deep faith can afford the luxury of skepticism and mm. you can be a skeptic and believe that something perfectly marvelous is going on. <laughs> you just don't know what it is. Mm. And you're not going to take the priest's word for it. But there is through Isn't all that a pretty good quote? It's, it's a lovely quote. But it seems to me that all the way through your life, all the way through your writing, there has been this, uh, this deep and profound gratitude for existence as well as this... Uh, this awareness of, of the bleak context in which it takes place. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you're you a contradictory old bugger, aren't you? Well, I'll blow my brains out. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, but you, I mean, you've had your share of pleasure. You've had your share of joy. Yes, you? I. you bet I have. You've I've, been I've, lucky I've, in some of your relationships. And yes, I have. And, and so I have certainly known highs. Uh, and mostly, I hate the world for what it's done to other people, not to me, mm. is I actually have nothing to complain of. And uh, uh, but what it did to my sister, what it did to my mother, what it did to my father, is uh, what my mother committed suicide. Uh, my thesis mentor at the University of Chicago in the anthropology department committed suicide. An agent, a dear agent, committed suicide. And, but you uh, considered it, didn't you? Yes, I did. And uh, uh, like Europe, uh, uh, did a poor job of it. Mm. Europe has certainly tried to commit suicide twice. What, I, you know, without invading, well, I don't think a writer has any privacy, finally, because, of course, you, you turn every all personal pain into art. But what was the crisis in your life that got you that close to killing yourself? Uh, uh, an impossible, well, it's, the answer is too personal. Sorry. Okay. Well, that's fine. I, I hate invading privacy, so let's, uh, yeah. let's move on. But it's not something you've ever, you've considered since, I take it, you having, having, well, having stuffed it up. No, but, but see, one reason not to do it is to, uh, leave a legacy to your descendants that this is a way to solve problems. And since my mother committed suicide, it always seems like a, a quite satisfactory way to solve problems. And, uh, you know, I've had the example if, if far Farmer A uh, can harvest uh, six bushels of potatoes an hour, and Farmer B, who can harvest four bushels of potatoes an hour, joins him. Uh, and you know, uh, then Farmer C comes over, and then Farmer A drops out. How many bushels uh, will they have harvested at the end of the day? And my answer is, I think I'll blow my brains out. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I've got on behalf of lots and lots and lots of Australians, some of whom are listening to you on, as we talk, and certainly on my own behalf. I'd like to thank you, Kurt Vonnegut, for making life less of a bummer for so many of us. All right, and can I send a greeting to a pen pal I have over there? Please. All right, well, his name is Nigel Gray, 
and he lives in Western Australia, in Kalamunda, and he and I have corresponded quite a bit, and he's a very good writer, incidentally, so tell him hi. Nigel Gray. Nigel Gray. Well, we'll make sure he gets that message. I'm, someone listening to the program will know him, and they'll get, right. and they'll get back to you. Right. They'll, get, they'll get the message back to him. Kurt, it's just wonderful to talk to you. Well, yeah, you're, you're very easy to talk to, I must say. Your latest book, just in case you've forgotten this, Kurt, is, is Man Without a Country, and it's published by Seven Stories Press. Can I give you a call in a couple of years to, to check you out again? Yes, of course. <laughs> Hey, this is, if this isn't nice, I don't know what is. Thanks. Thanks, Kurt. Bye.